Good morning and a very warm welcome to everybody here in the building and also those of you who are watching and listening at home. God's steadfast love is established forever. God's faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. We worship God as we sing the hymn, Summer suns are glowing over land and sea. Happy light is flowing, bountiful and free. Let us pray. Lord God, your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You show us the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy. Accept this act of worship and use it for your glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you are so to be trusted, and yet we have not really put our trust in you. You have so guided us in the past, and saved us from disaster, and yet we are often so faint-hearted as we face the future. We often walk with evidence. We are so ashamed of our lack of faith, our failure to trust you and utterly commit ourselves to you. Let the memory of your faithfulness kindle in us now courage for today. Help us to put our hand in yours and commit ourselves to you, to ignore our fears, since nothing can take us out of your care, and you are love and power. Forgive us, and be our strength and stay, for now into your hands we commit our spirits. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Amen.
and the collect for the day, the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time, let us pray. Merciful God, out of the depths we cry to you, and you hear our prayer. Make us attentive to the voice of your Son, that we may rise from the death of sin and take creation. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ and ever. Amen. We sing again Charles Wesley's hymn, Jesus, if still the same thou art, if all thy promises are sure. Now, Chris is going to bring us our reading from the Old Testament. Key three. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is wonderfully good to those who wait for him and seek him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And it is good for the young to submit to the yoke of discipline. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, then at last there is hope for them. 
Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike. Let them accept the insults of their enemies. For the Lord does not abandon anyone forever. Though he brings grief, he also shows We now join together in saying Psalm 130. I will say the words in faint type, if you could please respond with those in bold. Out of the depths I have called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If you, Lord, should note what we do wrong, who then, O Lord, can stand? waits for him, and in his word is my hope. O Israel, trust in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is ample redemption. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And now we read from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Jesus heals in response to faith. When Jesus went back to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. A leader of the local synagogue, whose name's, name was Jairus, came and fell down before him, pleading with him to heal his little daughter. She is about to die, he said in desperation. Please come and place your hands on her, Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and the crowd thronged behind. And there was a woman in the crowd who had had an hemorrhage for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors through the years and had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had got no better. In fact, she was worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched the fringe of his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his clothing, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped and she could feel that she had been healed. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, All this crowd is pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You have been healed. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from Jairus' home with the message, Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus ignored their comments and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just trust me. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw the commotion and the weeping and wailing. He went inside and spoke to the people. Why all this weeping and commotion, he asked. The child isn't dead. She is only asleep. The crowd laughed at him but he told them all to go outside. 
Then he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Get up, little girl. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. Her parents were absolutely overwhelmed. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what had happened, and he told them to give her something to eat. Amen. Thank you, Chris. We now join together again in singing the hymn, Heal us, Emmanuel, hear our prayer. We wait to feel thy touch. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Redeemer. Amen. In our Gospel reading this morning, we have two powerful stories that are interwoven. The main story is about Jairus' daughter. And in the version that Chris read, it does not say what Jesus said in Hebrew, which was Talitha kum, get up, little girl. And I can remember as a little girl being convinced that Jairus' daughter was called Talitha. But the story had great resonance with me as a child because when I was ill, I just wished that Jesus would come and touch me like he had touched Jairus' daughter and heal me. This morning, we are going to not look at that story, but look at the story within that story. Here we have a poor woman, a woman who was suffering from hemorrhaging. Nowadays, she would be cured easily just by one visit to her GP. But in those days, there was no cure. She must have been desperate. In the Talmud, which is the central text for rabbinic 
Judaism. There are fewer, no fewer, than 11 cures for this woman's ailment. Some of them were tonics, some of them were astringents, and others were just superstitions. She had tried everyone. And not only did her illness affect her health, she was also by Jewish law unclean, cut off from worshipping God, cut off from the fellowship of her friends. She was penniless, having spent all her money on those 11 cures. Jesus was her last resort. Now, every devout Jew wore an outer robe with four tassels on each corner, and they were the badge to say that they were a devout Jew. And Jesus would have worn such a robe. And it was one of these tassels that the woman slipped through the crowd and touched. This passage tells us something about three people. First of all, it tells us about Jesus. Every time Jesus healed someone, it took something out of him. And this is a lesson to us all. Many of you, if you've been watching television that, and the channels that have adverts, will have seen the latest PlusNet advert, though it's been going on for a few months now. And PlusNet, a Yorkshire company, are educating the nation in Yorkshire expressions. The latest one is, that'll do. Now, in Yorkshire, people tend to understate things. And whereas in the rest of the country and over here in Northern Ireland, if someone says, oh, that'll do, it means, oh, it's good enough. Not so in Yorkshire. If a Yorkshire person says, that'll do, they say it with pride, because it's the best, it's top notch. If a job is worth doing, it's worth doing well. We will never produce anything great unless we are prepared to put something of ourselves, our heart and soul into it. Michelangelo, who is probably one of the best sculptures that has ever lived, sculpted some fantastic works of art. I have been privileged to see some of them in the flesh. I was, went to Florence. I saw David. I saw the Medici Chapel, as you can see the pictures on the screen. But these do not reflect the art. Because when you see them in the flesh, and I mean actually in the flesh, they come alive. The marble is living, breathing. Because Michelangelo put his heart and soul into every piece of work. The piece of marble that he sculpted David from had been sat in Florence for years. Sculptors had come and gone, looked at it. The town was wanting someone to make an iconic statue for, the, for the, their plaza, for the center of the town. Sculptors look at, looked at the marble and said, no, not me. One even attempted to chisel away at it and gave up. Michelangelo looked at the marble and it took him two and a half years of blood, sweat and tears to create what we see now as one of the most famous sculptures in the world. Jesus 
was prepared to pay the price of helping others. And that price was the outpouring of his very life. If we are to follow in his footsteps, we must be prepared to spend ourselves, heart and soul. And this passage also tells us about the disciples. It shows the limitations of common sense. The disciples took the view, how could Jesus avoid being touched by the jostling crowd? It was a sensible way to look at things. They did not realize that it cost Jesus to heal. One of the tragedies of this life is the insensitiveness of the human mind. In 1939, the British government produced the Keep Calm slogan in preparation for World War II. And then in the year 2000, it was rediscovered. Now it's everywhere. And as you see on the screen, the, one of my favorite uh, ones is keep calm and drink tea. But this slogan is typically British. We are known across the world for our stiff upper lip, a cool head in times of crisis. We are not ones for showing our emotions. But if we personally don't have the experience of a situation, we often miss the fact that it is costing someone else. As many of you know, I work in an after-school club and have been working with children for many years. And we have one little boy who comes to the club when this little boy was in P1, he was always having meltdowns, bursting into tears at the slightest thing, if he lost at anything, if something did not go to plan, if something didn't go his way, or if someone pushed in front of him in a queue, he would just burst into tears. We all put it down to the fact Oh, he's a sore loser. Oh, he must be spoilt at home and have his own way all the time. It wasn't until he'd moved on a few years, left P1, that he changed. And we happened to mention it to his mummy. Oh, he's been a lot better recently, hasn't been bursting into tears. She said, you know, we didn't know what was wrong with him until his granddad was diagnosed with dementia. Now, this little boy had been going one afternoon a week after school to his granddad. He, at that young tender age of four and five, had known that there was something wrong with granddad. He'd picked it up. No one else had. And the only way he could express that something was wrong with Grandad was by having these meltdowns. As soon as Grandad was diagnosed and he knew that it, what was wrong with Grandad and everything was okay, he was okay. That was a lesson to the staff where I work. We need to be more sensitive to others. We need to have imaginative insight to be able to see into the hearts of others and to know what their problems are. And thirdly, this story tells us about the woman. It tells of the relief of confession. It would have been difficult for her to confess First of all, 
it was an embarrassing ailment she had. Secondly, the humiliation. But once she had told the whole truth, the fear and embarrassment were gone, and she was filled with relief. Not only was she physically healed, she was mentally healed too. One of my husband's favorite films is Crocodile Dundee. Some of you may have seen the film. It's been out for quite a few years and it's often repeated on television. And Crocodile Dundee, an Australian, has a friend called Wally. And Wally is what you might call not the brightest button in the box. Anyway, an American journalist finds out about Crocodile Dundee killing crocodiles and goes over to Australia. And then she brings him back to America. And he has quite an education finding out about American civilization and the fact that Americans have psychiatrists that they go to unload all their problems. And Crocodile Dundee says, back home there, if you've got a problem, you tell Wally. He tells the whole town, brings it out in the open, no problem. So often, we suffer in silence, instead of sharing our burdens. I can remember years ago when I went back backpacking with the ranger guides, and if there were three of us going to sleep in a tent, we would share the tent between us to help carry the load. One person would take the poles, another would take the inner tent with the ground sheet sewn in, and a third person would take the fly sheet and the pegs. We would share out the cooker. One would take the actual cooker, another would take the fuel for the cooker, and someone else the pots and pans. And so the burden was evenly shared amongst us, so no person was carrying everything. Our lives today are so busy. We rush around. We haven't time to stop. But let us make time to stop and listen. To listen to people who might need to unload a book understands. Jesus has time. He had time for the woman. Oh yes, he was, it was a, a, a really pressing thing that Jairus wanted him immediately to go and heal his daughter. Oh, he could have rushed by and not done anything, not said anything about the woman touching his cloak. But he had time. He stopped. Even though he was busy, he listened. So let's not be half-hearted in all we do. Let's be more sensitive and pray for imaginative insight. Let's not suffer in silence. Here was a woman who came to Jesus as a last resort. Many have come to Jesus when they are at their wit's end. Have faith. It's never too late to come and reach out to Jesus. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. Jesus said to the woman, You are now well because of your faith. May God give you peace. You are healed, and you will no longer be in pain. Amen. We sing Fred Pratt Green's hymn, O Christ the Healer, we have come to pray for health, to plead for friends. Thank you. 
now turn to our prayers, and first a prayer of thanksgiving, followed by our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Most loving God, creator of all that is good, we bless your holy name. Through Jesus Christ you have revealed that your purposes for the world are those of grace and love. His ministry and death and rising make plain your will that all should have fullness of life. Though what we sinners deserve is death, you freely give us eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We bless you for the Holy Spirit, whose gifts build up the church and equip us to serve the world in love and proclaim the good news of Christ. Most loving God, we bless your holy name and worship you with the Son and the Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for those facing death. The family gathered at the bedside of a loved one. The friend waiting by the telephone for news. The young soldier going into battle. The mother cradling her starving child. The criminal on death row, the person with terminal illness, the person contemplating suicide. Eternal and loving parent of us all, when death, its mystery and finality, becomes the overshadowing reality in our lives, be with us, the light in our darkness, the hope in our sorrow and fear. God of life and death, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who have been bereaved, those too shocked to take in what has happened, those angry with the person who has died and with you, those eaten away by remorse and guilt, those whose world has collapsed. We bring to you their sorrow, their pain, their loneliness, their anxiety. Eternal and loving parent of us all, when grief and desolation overwhelm us and we can find no comfort or peace, be with us, the light in our darkness, the hope in our sorrow and fear. You are the giver of eternal life, God of life and death. Hear our prayer in the name of him who gave up everything, even his own life, that we might know the love and life that never die, Jesus Christ, our risen Saviour. Amen. Our closing hymn is Charles Wesley's hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise.
Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Teach us to offer ourselves to your service, that here we may find have your peace, and in the world to come may see you face to face, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with kindness and give you peace.